So today we're going to hear from Luke and David about micronutrients or metal micronutrients to be specific. Um, so first, first of all, um, Dr. Luke Bridgestock is going to speak. And Luke is um, currently a Leverholm Trust Early Career Fellow at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Uh, he did his postdoc at Oxford University and before that his PhD at Imperial College in London. And so his research interests are in the cycling of metals in the marine environment in the context of understanding anthropogenic perturbations to metal cycles. And um, the major focus of his research now is development of new metal isotope systems as tools to study the biogeochemical cycle. General introduction on micronutrients and then focusing also a little bit on iron. So without further ado, I hand over to Luke. So thanks for the introduction, uh, Anya. And I, I should clarify that despite the kind of broad title that I've got here about um, metal micronutrient cycling, I'm actually really just gonna focus pretty much entirely on iron and its potential role in, in uh, driving the carbon cycle uh, in this region of the ocean. And so before I move on to talk about iron, however, I'm gonna recap um, some of the stuff that we, we learned in the seminars last week from Chibo and Anya, because that's going to be relevant for really understanding how iron fits into this story. And so we're interested in the cycling of key nutrients in the ocean in general, because they're key drivers and limiters of, of what's called the biological carbon pump. And so this is a, a set of processes which act together to uh, partition carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the deep ocean. And so the supply of key nutrients to the photic zone is what uh, drives the production of new biomass, so photosynthetic phytoplankton, which produce, uh, convert CO2 into organic carbon. And that this also um, uh, allows a flux of this, uh, the supply rate of these nutrients also um, drives or allows this flux of organic carbon to sink into the deep ocean. Um, in the deep ocean, the majority of this organic carbon is then uh, broken down via respiration and it's released back into, into the water as CO2. And so in upwelling regions such as uh, in Namibia, where these uh, CO2 rich deep waters then get upwelled back to the surface, this then results in a degassing of this, this CO2. However, respiration of this organic matter in the deep ocean also results in the release of nutrients and the accumulation of nutrients to high concentrations in these deep waters. So that means when you upwell these waters, you're also bringing and resupplying these nutrients back to the surface ocean. And this allows you to um, uh, uh, do more photosynthesis and re-sequester large amounts of CO2 back into phytoplankton and, and back into the deep ocean via the, the biological carbon pump. And so we there was a bit of uh, talk last week about whether or not this region of the ocean was a net source or sink of CO2. And one of the major controls on, on whether this is a source or sink really is, is thinking about the balance of how much CO2, respired CO2 is being brought to the surface via upwelling versus how much nutrients are in these waters, which then allow you to re-sequester a certain amount. So it's the net, um, the net balance between CO2 supply via upwelling versus nutrient supply to allow CO2 sequestration. So that's one of the ideas we're going to kind of think about more in this in this talk. And so when we talk about the cycling of these key nutrients, more often than not, so the nutrients we're talking about are nitrate and phosphate. And Anya gave a nice talk on uh, centered around these these nutrients last week. And so these are these are the major macronutrients that are responsible for driving and limiting uh, biological productivity in the ocean. And because of this, you can see that their concentrations in surface waters are, are driven to zero, or in the case of phosphate, often near to zero um, due to the uptake of these nutrients into biomass. In the deep ocean, due to respiration of organic matter, you can see that they then increase to higher concentrations. Um, an important concept is that um, these nutrients, nitrate and phosphate, are cycled 
uh, in a relatively fixed ratio to each other and as well to, as, well as uh, to carbon during the uptake of these nutrients and carbon into biomass via photosynthesis and their release during respiration. And so for every one mole of phosphate, which is taken up via photosynthesis, you can sequester 106 moles of carbon. Uh, and that this requires also 16 moles of nitrate. And the reverse happens when you break this organic matter down in the deep ocean. And so you can think about it. If this was all that happened, you can imagine that as deep water spend, water spends more time in the deep ocean, it's accumulating carbon, nitrate, and phosphate via respiration within this fixed red field ratio meaning that when you re-upwell these waters to the surface in this kind of idealized ocean, these waters should contain exactly the right amount of phosphate and nitrate to drive uh, photosynthesis to re-sequester the same amount of carbon that you brought to the surface uh, in the first place. And so uh, in this simple model of the ocean, uh, upwelling would be a kind of a neutral process in terms of emitting or, or sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere. However, it's not as simple as that because these are, this is not all that's happening. Um, there are additional processes in the nitrogen cycle, which Anya spoke about last week and, and mentioned were really important um, processes uh, in the uh, Namibian region. Uh, and that's that nitrate can be lost in the deep ocean via processes called denitrification and, and anamox. And so that this means that um, Upwelling waters are often slightly deficient in nitrate relative to phosphate uh, compared to this ratio and relative to carbon, which means that ultimately nitrate is, is usually the limiting nutrient. So you're, you're left with a residual amount of phosphate that goes unused um, due to this process. And it also means that there is insufficient nutrients now in the water when you upwell it to, to re-sequester the same amount of carbon that you bring to the surface via upwelling. And so you're going to you're going to actually leak CO2 into the atmosphere rather than re-sequester more, more CO2 on, on kind of a net uh, balance. Uh, the reverse of this process to kind of help balance things out is a um, process called nitrogen fixation, uh, which happens in the surface ocean and in areas where you've got excess phosphate uh, remaining after you've consumed all the nitrates. And it occurs um, by a, a group of cyanobacteria who can convert uh, gaseous nitrogen from the atmosphere into nitrate uh, as a nutrient that can be used in the ocean. And ultimately, the, this helps to restore this imbalance uh, between N and P created by these processes, denitrification and anamox, and helps to sort of re-sequester and balance this carbon cycle. And so this is this picture is particularly important to understand the, the region that we're, we're interested in for this seminar series, so the northern Benguelan upwelling system. And that's because the waters upwelling in this region have a particularly pronounced um, deficit of nitrate relative to phosphates. And that's expressed here in this map of a property of something called P star, which is essentially the, the, the excess amount of phosphate left over once all the nitrate has been consumed. So it's essentially this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, gap here in the in the amount of phosphate left once you've consumed all the nitrate by uh, productivity. And so the higher the P star, you can think of it as the higher the, the nitrate deficit due to nitrogen loss in the deep ocean. And also this means that you're going to have a net imbalance in the, that you're going to have less nutrient content and less nitrate in these waters compared to uh, respired carbon. Uh, and so this means that the uh, Benguela upwelling system, or at least contributes to the fact that the Benguela upwelling system in the, in the north is a, a net source of degassing CO2 to the atmosphere. So more CO2 is brought to the surface by upwelling than is re-sequestered by productivity. Um, you can see that these high P-star waters are then transported across the South Atlantic uh, via surface circulation. And it's, it's been hypothesized and shown by uh, limited data that nitrogen fixation then occurs in these waters. And this will help restore this imbalance in N to P and also help to re-sequester more CO2 and kind of bring this uh, region back into a, a balance uh, for its CO2 emissions, but over a longer scale. And so that's hopefully kind of uh, the last two lectures summarized in kind of a nutshell and, and kind of the important aspects we need to to think about for introducing a little bit more complexity. 
And uh, as complicated as this, this picture seems, I'm gonna make it more complicated and suggest that to really fully understand the biological carbon pump in, in, in this region and globally, we need to think about more than just the cycling of nitrate and phosphate. And so just taking a, a step back a minute, um, so life is more than just carbon, nitrogen, and phosphate. And in, in detail, it requires about 30 elements. Um, and so a, a key question really is, which of these elements is going to be the limiting nutrient for driving the growth of, of biomass? And it, typically, it's assumed to be nitrate or phosphate. Um, and what's going to control this is uh, the relative demand. So how much is needed by, by, by life, by biology, uh, relative to how much is available in seawater. And this is what's summarized nicely in this plot. So on the x-axis is the ratio of these different nutrient elements to carbon found in phytoplankton. So it's a, a measure of the relative biological demand of these elements. And on the y-axis is the amount of these different elements uh, available relative to carbon in seawater. So if you plot closer, you plot to this bottom right-hand corner, uh, essentially, the higher the biological demand is relative to availability, and, and, and the, the higher the potential it is for that nutrient to be limiting. They're still going on. So you can see that there's, the, the, there's this group of elements that plot with quite high um, concentrations in biology, and these are the, what we call the macronutrients. And you can see out of these macronutrients, in fact, nitrate and phosphate are the ones that are going to be in the highest demand relative to their availabilities. They are the limiting macronutrients, and we're right to really study these in detail to understand the biological carbon pump. However, there's this other group of elements that plot down here. They, they uh, occur only in trace quantities in biology, but they're equally in, important. Uh, so they're called the micronutrients. The, the one is from... Um... And you can see that although they have relatively low biological demands, they're very scarce in seawater. And so I'm going to draw your attention to these micronutrients in particular. So iron, manganese, and cobalt have a, a equal, if not even higher potential to limit productivity in parts of the ocean than N and P. And so I'm going to really focus on the cycling of iron in the ocean in more detail now and how that's important for, for really understanding the biological carbon pump. And so at a global level, the importance of, of iron as a micronutrient for, for um, regulating the, the, uh, the biological carbon pump is summarized quite nicely in these two plots. So on the left, we're looking at uh, concentrations of nitrates in surface waters. And on the right, we're looking at that, the same map, but for phosphate concentrations. And you can see that much of the low latitude ocean is completely depleted in nitrates. Uh, which is consistent with this being ultimately the limiting nutrient. So all of the nitrate has been used up to fuel the growth of biomass and then it's run out. Uh, and you can see that in these regions, there's often a residual amount of phosphate left over, reflecting the fact that uh, nitrate has been depleted by these processes in the deep ocean, which I was talking about before. You can see, however, that there are regions of the ocean, such as the, the Southern Ocean and the uh, Equatorial Pacific, as well as the high latitude Pacific, where both nitrate and phosphate are non-zero. So there's a, a lot of nitrate and phosphate left in surface waters that has not been used to fuel uh, the growth of biomass. And the reason for this is that in these regions, these are not the limiting nutrients. And it's been uh, shown with lots of incubation studies that, in fact, the availability of iron is the limiting factor for the growth of biomass in these regions. And so iron is uh, really important alongside nitrate and phosphate to study because it actually limits uh, productivity in about 30% of the, the surface ocean. Iron has a further important control on the biological carbon pump, however, because in these regions where iron is not limiting, it, it's also quite important because um, it's, it's involved in, uh, it's a key control on mediating nitrogen fixation. Uh, so the key enzyme that cyanobacteria uh, use to, to do nitrogen fixation requires lots of iron. And so iron in, in these regions will control the nitrate to phosphate deficit ratio and, and ultimately the, the carbon balance uh, in these regions as well. So these are the two reasons we really care about iron. And so the distribution of, of N and P in these maps really is fundamentally controlled by the distribution of, of iron availability 
and seawater at a global scale. So we're going to talk about a little bit more about the global iron cycle in the ocean and what's going to, going to control this pattern. So we've learned uh, a huge amount actually over the past sort of 10, 20 years on, on the, the distribution of iron in the ocean and the processes which control it, uh, thanks to a, a program called uh, Geotraces, which has um, sampled um, the ocean at a global scale and measured the distribution of key trace metals such as iron and for many other elements as well. And so here are some of the results from this um, program from a cruise that uh, goes off the, the coast of Angola, so just north of the, the kind of study region of this seminar series, out across the uh, South Atlantic. And you can see that um, in the surface waters, iron concentrations are, are very low and they increase with depth. So it's got a, a nutrient-like distribution similar to, to nitrate and phosphate. And this reflects the fact that iron is a nutrient, so it's being taken up into, into biomass uh, in product, by productivity in the photic zone and is then being released uh, via respiration in the deep ocean. However, there's an additional uh, sink term in the iron cycle. So iron is also being removed from solution via a process called particle scavenging. Um, and so essentially the, the majority of iron in, in the ocean is, is in uh, its three plus oxidation state and it's incredibly insoluble and it tends to precipitate out of solution as, as iron oxyhydroxide minerals. And so because iron has this added sink term in its cycle, it means that iron in the deep ocean is constantly being depleted relative to, to nitrate and phosphate compared to its, um, red, its uh, red field ratio, if you like, compared to biological demand. And so if this was all that would happen, you can imagine that upwelling of deep waters everywhere would be iron limited. They would be deficient in iron compared to these macronutrients and, and iron would limit productivity everywhere, uh, which as we saw on the map in the previous slide is, is not the case. Uh, and that's because external inputs of iron to different parts of the ocean are really important for alleviating this iron, uh, this kind of tendency for iron limitation uh, and supplying additional sources of iron uh, to different regions of the ocean. And so understanding the distribution and the magnitude of these external iron sources is really important for understanding patterns of, of iron limitation and as well as, as patterns of, of sort of nitrogen fixation. And so these important sources include the deposition of dust, which has been blown off the land and, and deposited uh, from very dry and arid regions uh, like Namibia, and deposited to the surface of the ocean. It also includes the release of iron from uh, continental margin sediments and input of iron from, from hydrothermal vents in, in the deep ocean. So moving on before I run out of time, I think it's probably worth then thinking about, well, that's kind of the, uh, the summary of the importance of the iron cycle for controlling the biological carbon pump at a global scale. Uh, but what do we know about the importance of, of this uh, micronutrients uh, in, in the study regions of the Northern Benguela upwelling system? Uh, well, the answer, short answer really is relatively little. So there's been one uh, major cruise which has mapped out the distribution of iron in the water column along this region, but at quite a low spatial resolution with just a few stations along the continental margin. However, a key finding from this study was that there's a large release of iron coming out of the um, shelf sediments in this region. So this is likely going to be an important so additional source of iron for upwelling waters in this region. Another potentially, but I think poorly quantified source of iron to waters of this region is the deposition of dust, which is being blown off uh, from these dry riverbeds. Uh, you can see these kind of lines of dust coming off these, these riverbeds on the Namibian margin. So David and I, um, who, so David's going to give the next talk. Uh, we're lucky enough to, to participate in, in RGNO in, in 2019, and we've generated a very limited data set, which I guess adds some in additional insight to this, this uh, research problem. Um, and we were lucky enough to sail on these two uh, cruise transects. Uh, so this is a map of uh, sea surface temperature. And you can see that there was, uh, there was active upwelling during the time of the cruises. So you've got these cold, uh, deep waters outcropping along the coast here. Um, 
this wasn't really the main objective of our field work. So we've got a very limited data set, but we measured five surface water samples collected on these transects. And if I'm plotting them against temperature, which is a, a proxy for sort of upwelling age. So the coldest waters here are freshly upwelled. And as they increase in temperature, they've, they've upwelled, uh, um, they're, they're being evicted away from the, from the uh, continental margin. And you can see that iron concentrations are highest in the, the coldest, most uh, recently upwelled water. And in fact, these are really high iron concentrations. So these are one to two orders of magnitude higher than what you would typically find in, in the open ocean. So this really clearly suggests that there's an additional source of iron to these waters being upwelled and is likely uh, the release of iron from, from bottom sediments along the shelf. Um, as we as temperature increases and we move offshore, you can see the iron concentrations rapidly drop. And this is similar to what's been observed for, for macronutrients, uh, likely reflecting the uptake of iron as, as this drives a bloom of, of uh, uh, productivity and potentially also uh, components of, of particle scavenging. So I think there's uh, a lot of interesting research to be done on the iron cycle specifically in the northern Benguelan upwelling system. I think the kind of key overarching question uh, which would be kind of driving this research would be how does iron control the carbon balance of, the, uh, of, this, re of this upwelling uh, region? And there's sort of two end member scenarios uh, in which, which could, you know, could occur and both of which iron is likely to play an important role in, in the carbon budget of this region. And so in the first scenario, the supply of iron to these upwelled waters, either from being released from, from shelf sediments or dust deposition is relatively low compared to nitrate. And this would mean that iron, not nitrate, could be the ultimately the limiting nutrient, the one that runs out first and prevents further growth of, of biomass. Um, in this scenario, uh, iron itself would have a direct effect on limiting the amount of CO2 resequestered by a productivity compared to that being degassed and would uh, uh, directly contribute to this net imbalance, this net degassing of CO2 from this region of the ocean. In the opposite scenario, you can imagine that the supply of iron is far greater uh, than that of the nitrate compared to biological demand. And uh, in fact, nitrate is the limiting nutrient. However, in this scenario, iron could also play an important role in the carbon cycle because it could be that you would then have excess iron available after the bloom of productivity to be exported as these waters are transported out across the South Atlantic. And this iron would then be available to drive uh, nitrogen fixation, which would allow further uh, carbon to be drawn down and would, would um, um, sort of bring the, the CO2 help bring the CO2 balance of this region, uh, this uh, budget of this region back into balance on a longer uh, spatial scale and help restore this uh, imbalance in N to P in these upwelled waters, which is quite well known. And so with that, I think I will uh, stop and take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, is there any, any questions you would like to ask uh, Luke? Because there's no questions in this in the in the chat box. I have a question. Yes, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Luke, for your uh, interesting talk. Uh, I was a bit um, intrigued by your uh, graph on, let's say, the um, the depth profile of iron in the um, southern Atlantic, where we notice, let's say, in the region of the Angola Benguela Front that we have, yeah, that one, have, uh, let's say, a peak uh, of um, iron concentrations roughly a, around a thousand meters water depth. And one of the explanations you proposed is, for instance, that the, the iron was coming from the continental shelves, but as, as far as I remember, those shelves are quite shallower, only a couple of hundreds of meters. Is there an explanation why we do find these increased levels of iron at this particular depth of around one kilometer? Uh, yeah, I think that might have just been me uh, mentioning the wrong word in this context. I think that this peak in iron uh, around a thousand meters is actually coming off the continental slope rather than the shelf. Um, and I believe, I mean, this is a not my paper, this is a, a paper by Abigail Noble. 
but uh, I think the explanation of, of where you see this uh, distribution of iron coming off the continent shelf coincides with an oxygen minimum zone and is controlled by the uh, redox. So iron becomes more soluble under low oxygen conditions when it's reduced to, to iron 2 plus. It's oh, okay. iron 2 plus oxidation yeah. state. Uh, the continental shelf is particularly important uh, for supplying iron to the upwelling system because that's um, essentially the depth at which upwelling waters will interact with the sediment. So these, this, this plume of iron coming off is probably too deep to really be picked up by the upwelling waters, which is why it's uh, more about iron release from the shelf in terms of the upwelling system. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, Kurt, go ahead. Uh, it's mostly still related to the nitrogen iron connection. And my question is, you are always saying nitrate, but in the shelf particularly, the nitrogen that comes out of the sediment is ammonia, which needs to be oxidized first to the nitrate. So how did you account for that large portion of nitrogen that's in the form of ammonia? Uh, again, I guess that's me not using my language correctly. I probably should have said nitrogen, um, nitrogen species rather than nitrate in terms of what's being upheld. I guess ammonia is still usable by the biology, if, if that's right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very usable. Yeah. <laughs> but you are meaning then, you mean the sum of nitrate. Sum, yeah, sorry, yes. So the sum of nitrogen species, I suppose, yeah, would be more correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, may I have another question, Dion? Um, yeah, just a, a comment is that um, we've, we've seen in, in at least the central Namibian um, coast, um, mostly we, we do all our, our monitoring on the 23, on the yeah, 23 line, um, that we have more or less three blooms. And we, at least I think um, the two, uh, primary and my secondary bloom, I can, I can explain and, and I will give a talk next week about that. But then there's a third bloom, which is more or less in um, August, July. And the only explanation I could, could give for that specific bloom, uh, which was um, around 20 meters uh, or a, a subsurface uh, rather, uh, that the possibility is that it could be due to, to iron. And, uh, and the reason for that is um, just before that period, we normally have our east weather conditions, meaning berg winds and where um, uh, quite a lot of dust is blown into, into the ocean. So, and I, I was just thinking that that to confirm if, if that might be the case. Uh, although the other nutrients is available, uh, I'm just thinking that iron might be just a, a additional push for, for phytoplankton blooms during that period. That's interesting. Yeah, I'd be interested to see. I guess one of the kind of uh, tests to see if it's iron limitation or not would be to look at um, whether the nitrogen uh, species nutrients, including nitrate and, and other ones, as Kurtz uh, uh, nicely pointed out, um, do uh, kind of progress to zero as you move offshore with, with respect to temperature or whether it looks like they converge to a non-zero value. Um, so I guess you'd need some of all of these nutrients to drive a productivity bloom. Um, but yeah, if, 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 there's a, if there's residual nitrogen species left in the water that gets exported and transported out of this region, that could be an indication that the iron is, is the limiter in, in that particular time period. Okay, thank you. Okay, may I have one more question, Dion? Yes. Well, I, I just wonder, uh, Luke, what has come out of that uh, period of time when they fertilized the ocean with iron? Um, yeah, I, I'm probably not the best expert to ask on that, but. As far as I'm aware, that, that kind of whole idea of uh, iron fertilization of the Southern Ocean to uh, kind of geoengineer the climate and, and mitigate human 
induced uh, CO2 emissions is uh, not very favorable at the moment. Um, I guess for, I think for two reasons, one of them was that these iron fertilization experiments, although they did uh, stimulate a lot of productivity, uh, I think it, it's, there was ambiguous evidence as to how much of that actually sunk out the deep, uh, from the surface to the deep ocean. Um, and so whether or not it'd be that effective in, in transporting carbon into the deep ocean. And secondly, I think there's real concern that when you add iron to these regions of the ocean, artificially change the nutrient makeup, you change the, um, you change the kind of planktonic community that grows there, which is gonna have uh, complicated and unforeseen and probably, probably quite negative effects on the, the rest of the ecosystem. So as far as I understand, that's not a very favorable idea uh, topic at the moment for, for a genuinely considered topic for trying to mitigate human climate change. Okay, thank you, Luke. Okay, I think if there are no more questions, then we can um, head to our second talk. Thank you very much, Luke.